All right, today is Monday the 15th. We're going to continue on. We have now gone through everything that was in part one of the book. In other words, we've done the first six chapters so far. All right, so as you guess, we're going to go into chapter two. Today we're going to cover chapters seven and eight, be able to do them nice and slow. Uh, front, or Wednesday, rather, all period on chapter nine. Next Monday, we will um, be going over chapters 10 and 11. Neither one of them is particularly long. And on Wednesday, we're going to learn to build a game as a class. All right? So that will all be explained as we go on in here. But the point is I want to go through chapters 7 and 8 now, accessing DOM elements using JavaScript and jQuery objects, and navigating and manipulating jQuery objects and DOM elements. There is excuse me, at least a share, there's some repetition between these chapters, and you'll see that again as we go on in here. I will mention to you, if you care, that um, you can go out here to the P drive for the class, and there is a folder out there with today's date on it. Feel free to copy that to your H drive or to your virtual desktop or wherever you typically copy this stuff. What you're going to see in there is literally there are a bunch of tables in Chapter 7 and a bunch of tables in Chapter 8. And what I've done is for each one of those tables, I've come up with examples. And I, I went out usually to either the jQuery site itself or to uh, Mozilla site for... for um, for JavaScript or whatever, but there's there are a bunch of examples out there. So again, what you'll see there is there's a folder for chip with all the ones for Chapter Seven. There is another folder with all the stuff on Chapter Eight. If you desire to know more about the DOM, there are a bunch of PDFs and other stuff that I found in here on the DOM. This is some general stuff that's on the DOM. Uh, this is a really nice tutorial if you've never seen it before. It's javascript.info. And literally, if you just go out to javascript.info, all right, and what I did was from here, I copied the documents and events, uh, I think the object oriented programming, and some of the other stuff. And I took them and put them into Word documents so you can see that. And it's just example after example, all right? There's a tutorial series that's on tootsplus.com called JavaScript and the DOM series. There's just two articles in it. There's another thing on tree traversal, so I put that out there. And if you've never seen these kind of things before, this is kind of interesting, at least in my opinion. It's called 81 jQuery Interview Questions and Answers, The Ultimate List. And especially for somebody like Luke, who's going to be graduating in May, Let's, let's assume for a second that Luke decides, you know what, I just know I want to be an ASP.NET programmer. All right, that's what I want to do. Then you should find an article that's like this, but rather than 81 jQuery questions, it would be 81 ASP.NET questions, or a certain number. It doesn't have to necessarily be 81. But what this does, this article, is it basically goes through just about everything there is jQuery. All right, and as we move on into this section, and especially in part three of the book, it's almost just jQuery this after jQuery this after jQuery this. So you're going to see this stuff again and again and again. All right. So you can see, if you're following along, I'm on page 197. We've got about five different... Um, objectives here. Tell the difference between a jQuery and a JavaScript DOM object. How to tell if an object is a jQuery object or is a DOM object. Basically how to convert one to the other and how to use jQuery selectors to find, quickly find DOM objects. <clears throat> and one thing about this, just so you know, the big difference between a jQuery object and a DOM object, a DOM object is something that gets built for you automatically when the web page is set up. A jQuery object is something, it's part of the jQuery library, 
look at it for lack of better words, is what jQuery did was they went in and they put a wrapper around a lot of the things that the DOM does naturally, all right, to try to give it easier syntax or maybe some abilities to do things that it couldn't do otherwise. <clears throat> so the author mentions here down near the bottom of the page, or I don't know if it's next page or whatever, <clears throat> DOM objects are the objects that the web browser is using to render elements on the page. That's good. The disadvantage of using DOM objects is they basically render everything that's on the page. And a lot of times, there's stuff that, that they render that you have absolutely no, no desire at all to look at, to use, to do whatever. All right. So some of the DOM things, and this is not an extensive list right here, but as it says, Table 7.1 provides a list of some of the DOM object use, objects you'd use most often. Just so you know, I got this stuff for this section literally from right here. I went out to the W3 school site and noticed under the JavaScript reference page, DOM object all. And if you do go out there, and again, you don't have to do this, but if you do go out there, what you're going to find is a listing of all the ones that are in here and a bunch of them that are not in here. Again, some people like uh, w3schools.com, some don't. For something like this, I think it's almost an ideal site because, for example, a pen child. All I do is highlight it. It gives me an example, and then there's a try it yourself. The code's right here. You click try it, and it gives you the information. You can manipulate this code any way you want and click try it and make it do whatever it is you want it to do. All right. So, again, <clears throat> it's not my goal here to go through all these, but one thing you do have to realize is virtually everything that gets created in the DOM gets created into what are called a series of nodes. And there's different type of nodes. All right. We'll get into some of this as we go on a little bit later. But anytime you see parent node, child node, and there's a few other things, you know, that's what you're working with. <clears throat> and it's built in a hierarchy. So really at the top is your HTML object. All right. And then if under your HTML object, let's suppose, for example, you've got a head object and you've got a body object. Well, then those become children. Those are child nodes of the HTML object. All right. It's pretty obvious when you look at that. Okay, and if you've got a title that's under your, your um, head, then that becomes a child of the head object, that kind of thing. And that's what they're talking about in here. All right. So as it says, the DOM object has a lot of properties and, and methods and a lot of stuff you probably wouldn't use. All right. But it is a fast way to do a lot of things when you're working on a web page and to do them dynamically. All right. For instance, when you look here under the click event, this enables you to execute or change the event handler that gets called when an HTML element is clicked. All right. So even though somebody clicks something, you can take that default behavior and change it. One of the things we're going to get into, in, not in this chapter, but in this section of the book, is talking about basically preventing defaults. And maybe you've seen this before, but the idea is, well, maybe I want to do something on a web page, and even though this is a hyperlink, when you click it, I don't want it to go to some site. So what I can do to keep that from happening is I can, I can use one of these things in here that's called a prevent default, which means take whatever would happen normally and just don't make it happen. All right. If I decide I want to write different things on a web page, one way I can do it is to use inner HTML. All right, you can use that to either add things to a web page or you can use it to modify existing things that are on a web page. The difference between inner HTML and outer HTML is inner HTML just has text in it and outer HTML has both the text and the tags that surround the text. <clears throat> Value is an important one. Many attributes that you work on on a web page are going to have a value attribute, especially if you decide that you're going to put a form on there because virtually everything on a form is going to have some kind of a value in it. All right? Again, maybe not as important in here, but you'll see it 
as we go on, you'll see it next semester, you know, doing some server side stuff also. ID and class, hopefully those are pretty self-evident. Style, hopefully is pretty self-evident. And these are two words that are in here, not the attribute part, but just so you know it, especially those of you, and that's most of you in here, that are in the Java class. What we're going to start talking about very soon are what are called getters and setters. And when you've got something like this that says get attribute, you know, you're, you're all, I think everybody in here, you're in the class with Denny before this, the um, MySQL class, and you're probably used to going in there and doing a select statement. So if I say select star from employees, it says show me every field in the employees table. But when you use a select statement, you can't change the information that's in there. You can change this presentation, but you can't change the data. Get works the same way. All right, if it's the first day of class and I don't know any of you, and Morgan walks in here and she says, good morning, and I say, good morning. She asks me, if, are you Jeff Scott? And I say, yeah, and what's your name? She tells me. That's a get name type of thing when you think about it. And prob probably, unless she's been married or is married, and I don't know, but uh, let's just assume the, that she's never, at least with her first name, it's never been changed. So probably when she was an infant and they came in and talked to her parents and said, what name are we supposed to put on the tag here? And they said, Morgan. All right. Well, that's a set. So when you set, what you're basically doing is you're changing. You're mutating. Setters are also called mutators. You're changing a value. When you're getting, it's like you're querying. All right. And again, you're going to see that kind of stuff over and over again. All right. So that very quickly, that was the DOM stuff. Then next, in the next table here that you see starting on the bottom of page 199 and going on to page 200, these are basically the equivalents of what you just saw on the DOM, but running it from jQuery. So again, as I mentioned, jQuery objects are basically wrappers around DOM objects. All right, and they've been written... To, because, at least for most people, they're easier to use than the corresponding DOM objects. All right, and you're going to see a lot of these as we go on in here. All right, so, I mean, something, whoops, I guess I can't do that, but something like this one right here. You should now all be able to look at this and say, now notice it says, again, this is straight jQuery. Dollar sign meaning it's jQuery the pound sign my input which means it's an ID called my input and the dot val means you're going to be setting the value and in this case you're going to set the value of that to the word test all right within <clears throat> I don't know at least probably within a few weeks you're going to be using add class if you haven't used it before you're going to be using it all over the place because what you can do to any element on a web page is you can use the jQuery add class method to literally add a class. And if there's an add class, there's a remove class. Sometimes you don't want to add an entire class. You just want to take a line or a paragraph or something else and bold it. All right? So if I literally, if I wanted to come in and let's say that I, for whatever reason, I wanted to take every paragraph on a page and I wanted to bold it. Again, I don't know why I'd want to do that, but let's assume I did. I can say dollar sign P means all paragraphs on the page, CSS. And it, when I'm putting here, this could be single quotes or double quotes. In either one, it doesn't matter. But that says literally bold every paragraph on the page. What if I don't want every paragraph on the page? All right, what if I only want paragraphs, you know, that, that come after divs? Then I just have to do this. So that's the kind of stuff that we are going to be doing and we're going to continue to do in here, and you're going to continue to put stuff like that into your website. Hide and show, hopefully those make a lot of sense, you know. To determine if an object is a DOM object, you can say if the name of your object dot node type. If it comes back true, it's a DOM object. If you say the name of your object dot jQuery and it comes back true, it's a jQuery object. If it becomes back false, you know, it's not. 
you can basically change one to the other. So you can convert one to the other. And it's not the kind of thing you're probably going to have to do all that often. But what's kind of neat is when you look at this, this is the way right here on the screen you used to have to do everything. You'd have to basically put an ID on just about everything on a web page. Then you'd have to say document.getElementById and boom. All right. You still can do that. And there are, there are literally thousands, if not millions, of sites out there that still do that. And that stuff's not going to change. Just because it might be easier to do it with jQuery doesn't mean that if somebody has done it in the past and did it the JavaScript way, that they're going to change it. Because, it, you know, it's the old, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I may have told you about this. I still remember one of the first things I was asked to do when I was hired in at AT&T is this... The, the, uh, my boss came in and said, hey, I want you to fix this code. It's a good way for you to learn. It's older code, and it's not used often, but, you know, it was a, a few hundred lines, and it had like 20 or 30 errors in it. And it was good because it did help me learn the language. But I noticed after I got it all to compile, there were 20 or 30 warnings in there. And I said, should I fix the warnings too? And he said, no. I said, why not? And he said, if that ain't broke, don't fix it. And believe me, there is a lot of that that goes on on IT sh at IT shops. All right, whether that's a right thing or a wrong thing isn't, you know, I guess in that case, wasn't for me to say because that was the boss. All right. Finding DOM objects by class name. So there's get element by ID for a single element. There's get elements by class name, so you can grab everything that's in a class. There's get elements by tag name. This is all straight JavaScript here. This is not jQuery. Again, jQuery being a JavaScript library. So it wouldn't matter here if these were paragraphs with, uh, with a class of my class or something else. Divs wouldn't matter. Here, this would be able to, in this case, it grabs all of the divs. All right. So in this example here, this first example, and I'm going to go through all of it in just a second, but all the code really is right here. So I'm going to bring it up just to show it to you. All right. As soon as I can find it, because unfortunately I cleaned this out, and I've got to remember where I put things. All right. So in this example, I don't know if I've got the right. I don't think I've got the right one up here. It's chapter seven. Okay. In this example, if I write in here, "Hello world." All right. Well, we're going to look at the code behind it in just a second. The stuff behind it. But this is an empty paragraph. This is an empty paragraph. This, I believe, is an empty div or span, and so is that. So what we're telling the system to do is whenever we type into update, update the first paragraph to whatever that is, and the second one to that, and then change the div or span or whatever it is. All right. So they're showing you how you can programmatically change something that's in here. And if we look at, uh, not at that source. Let's take a look at the source from the book. which I just closed. So hopefully, I mean, looking at this, not very difficult. What do we have here? We've got an ID here that's called text in type equal text and a button next to it. Well, these two lines that are right here, those two lines are creating this right here. All right, that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. And then when you look afterwards, we've got what? 
span class equal heading, span class equal heading. All right, so we've got two spans, and there's nothing in either one of those. Then we've got two paragraphs, P1 and P2, and there's nothing in either one of those. So we come down here, and what are we doing? We're basically telling this to iterate through here and grab every single one of these paragraphs, and the in element dot value is whatever we ended up putting in here. So we tell it to go in there and change it to updating, all right, and they put I plus one, otherwise it would have said updating zero to make it fun, updating one to make it fun, so that's why they did the calculation in there, all right? So all they're doing is basically iterating their way through here and to show you how you can change things dynamically on the fly. Again, that was done using straight JavaScript, all right? And then, starting on whatever the next page is here, um, <clears throat> 205, they talk about using jQuery selectors. These are things that are going to have to become second nature to you. So again, anytime you do this, so if you've got dollar sign and then within either single quotes or double quotes, you've got an asterisk. That's, that's like using CSS when you had the asterisk, which means change everything. That's what that means. You're not going to probably use that often. All right? But if I've got this right here, so anytime I come through here and I put in something like this, dot, you know, whatever. That's going to look what, and, you know, every time for everything with a class of whatever. All right? And if I put the pound sign in, of course, it'll look for every ID of that. And he gives you some examples. So you can see that'll select all elements with a class of container. That'll select the HTML element or elements with an ID of menu. All right? I can put an actual element in there them itself. That will select all divs. If I want to select not just divs, but in this case, divs and spans and paragraphs, I can just comma separate them. All right. If I want to select all <clears throat> ULs with a class of big list, then I just append this on. UL with a class of big list. Again, if it had been instead of a class, if it had been an ID, it would have been UL pound sign big list. These are all things that are going to have to basically become second nature to you, all right? When you come in and you start working, especially when you start working with uh, form elements, you start using some of the stuff that's in here. One of the things I mentioned to you in a previous lecture is we talked a little bit about regular expressions. This stuff is almost regular expressions because this right here says, an attribute where anywhere, the asterisk, contains the word value, all right? You know, as it says, class with content in the class name, okay? The caret means begins with, so it begins with the word value. If it, there's a dollar sign there instead of a caret, it means ends with the word value, all right? This, of course, as you probably guess, is not equal to. So there's a lot of different ways that this stuff can be used. If there's a problem with, with a library like jQuery, it's the fact that virtually you're given countless ways of doing the same thing. All right? And when people say, well, that okay, if that's the case, then which one do I use? You use the one that makes the most sense to you. Unless you're told in your specs, make sure you do this. All right? Here are some other ones. Here's some content selectors. You'll notice that each one of these starts with a colon. And again, they, show, they, they explain the syntax and give you an example. Syntax and example. It's not, it doesn't pay to go through every one of these. The chances of, of, of you, know, you going through all those and memorizing them right, on, right on, you know, on the fly here probably aren't that good. But notice you can come in here, and these two are opposites of one another. So you can select elements that are empty, and you can select elements that have something in them. All right. 
hierarchy selectors. Again, I, I don't know what you guys went through when you were in the 157 class, but this is stuff that you should have gone through. All right? So as it says right here with the ancestor element, div span, selects all spans that are underneath a div. Doesn't mean that they're direct descendants, but they're somewhere under the div. So in between the beginning and the ending div tag, if there's a span in there, that will select it. All right? If you look at the next one here, parent child. So here it selects all span elements that have an immediate parent element that is a div with a class of menu. All right? So that has to come right under it. The next one with a plus sign. Notice, selects all label elements that are immediately followed by an input element that has a class of text item. And sometimes when you look at this, you're like, there's got to be an easier way to do it than this. And typically there is. Finally, the last one that's in here, notice, selects all div elements that are siblings of an element that has an ID of menu. Okay? Now, one thing I mentioned to you, you, you may or may not care about this, but um, at the beginning of the semester is if you go out to the Blackboard site, right near the beginning, I've done a couple lectures on just straight HTML, and I went over these selectors. All right? Here's stuff that is specific just to forms. All right? As it says, input elements that are checked. Okay? Options that are selected. Focus. All right? You can enable and you can disable things. All right? Visibility is pretty simple. It's either visible or it's not visible. I may have mentioned this before, but just on the off chance I did not, when you look at this, this kind of drives some people nuts. Because <clears throat> remember, the first element when you're working with CSS is element zero. So if I ask for all the even elements, when it, it, for you and I, it probably looks like it selected the odd ones, but it's selecting zero, two, four, six. All right? You can grab the first of something, the last of something. You can check for equality. You can check for inequality, greater than. You know, basically all of the different kinds of relational operators that we've used. You can check, as it says, to see whether or not something's being animated. The example that they put in here, we'll go over it, but it's, I don't know if it's a great example or not a great example, but if we take a look at what's in here, if you look right here, all right, again, notice none of these are bolded when I click even because 0, 2, 4, and 6. If I click odd, 1, 3, 5, and 7. If I click the first four, it's 0, 1, 2, and 3. So as long as you keep that in mind, unfortunately, there are a couple of these things when you get into them. They're, they're, it's actually possible that some of the stuff will start with 0 and some stuff starts with 1. That's where it becomes a real big pain in the butt. Not that I know. Well, you could write, kind of write your own offset in your code. So instead of checking, I, I would think with, with writing some code, yeah, you could. <clears throat> and that pretty much is it for Chapter 7. So let me stop taping here, start up again, and we'll, go, we'll start on Chapter 8 right away.